The Salamander's Tale. The Central Valley runs much of the length of California, bounded by the coastal range to the west and by the Sierra Nevada to the east. These long mountain ranges link up at the north and the south ends of the valley, which is therefore surrounded by high ground. Throughout this high ground lives a genus of salamanders called Ensatina. The Central Valley itself, about forty miles wide, is not friendly to salamanders, and they are not found there. They can move all round the valley, but normally not across it, in an elongated ring of more or less continuous population. In practice, any one salamander's short legs in its short lifetime don't carry it far from its birthplace, but genes persisting through a longer time scale are another matter. Individual salamanders can interbreed with neighbours whose parents may have interbred with neighbours further round the ring, and so on. There is therefore potentially gene flow all around the ring. Potentially, what happens in practice has been elegantly worked out by the research of my old colleagues at the University of California at Berkeley, initiated by Robert Stebbins and continued by David Wake. In a study area called Camp Wallahi. In the mountains to the south of the valley, there are two clearly distinct species of Ensatina which do not interbreed. One is conspicuously marked with yellow and black blotches; the other is a uniform light brown with no blotches. Campolahi is in a zone of overlap, but wider sampling shows that the blotched species is typical of the eastern side of the Central Valley, which here in Southern California is known as the San Joaquin Valley. The light brown species, on the contrary, is typically found on the western side of the San Joaquin. Non-interbreeding is the recognised criterion for whether two populations deserve distinct species names. It therefore should be straightforward to use the name Ensatina eschscholzii for the plain western species, and Ensatina clauberi for the blotched eastern species. Straightforward, but for one remarkable circumstance, which is the nub of the tale. If you go to the mountains that bound the north end of the Central Valley, which up there is called the Sacramento Valley, you'll find only one species of Ensatina. Its appearance is intermediate between the blotched and the plain species, mostly brown with rather indistinct blotches. It is not a hybrid between the two. That is the wrong way to look at it. To discover the right way, make two expeditions south, sampling the salamander populations as they fork to west and east. On either side of the Central Valley, on the east side they become progressively more blotched until they reach the extreme of Clauberi in the far south. On the west side, the salamanders become progressively more like the plain Eschscholzii that we met in the zone of overlap at Camp Wallahi. This is why it is hard to treat Eschscholzii and Clauberi with confidence as separate species. They constitute a ring species. You'll recognise them as separate species if you only sample in the south. Move north, however, and they gradually turn into each other. Zoologists normally follow Stebbins' lead and place them all in the same species, but give them a range of subspecies names. Stebbins believes that the ancestors of Ensatina arrived at the north end of the Central Valley and evolved gradually down the two sides of the valley, diverging as they went. An alternative possibility is that they started in the south, as say Eschscholzii, then evolved their way up the west side of the valley, round the top, and down the other side, ending up as Clauberi at the other end of the ring. Whatever the history, what happens today is that there is hybridisation all round the ring, except where the two ends of the line meet in the far south of California. As a complication, it seems that the Central Valley is not a total barrier to gene flow. Occasionally, salamanders seem to have made it across, for there are populations of one of the western subspecies on the eastern side of the valley where they hybridise with the eastern subspecies. Yet another complication is that there is a small break near the south end of the ring, where there seem to be no salamanders at all. Presumably, they used to be there, but have died out, or maybe they are still there. But have not been found. The mountains in this area are rugged and hard to search. The ring is complicated, but a ring of continuous gene flow is nevertheless the predominant pattern in this genus, as it is with the better-known case of herring gulls and lesser black-backed gulls around the Arctic Circle.
In Britain, the herring gull and the lesser black-backed gull are clearly distinct species. Anybody can tell the difference, most easily by the colour of the wingbacks. Herring gulls have silver-grey wingbacks, lesser blackbacks, dark grey, almost black. More to the point, the birds themselves can tell the difference too, for they don't hybridise, although they often meet and sometimes even breed alongside one another in mixed colonies. Zoologists therefore feel fully justified in giving them different names, Larus argentatus and Larus fuscus. But now here's the interesting observation and the point of resemblance to the salamanders. If you follow the population of herring gulls westward to North America, then on around the world, across Siberia and back to Europe again, you notice a curious fact. The herring gulls, as you move round the pole, gradually become less and less like herring gulls and more and more like lesser black-backed gulls, until it turns out that our Western European lesser black-backed gulls actually are the other end of a ring-shaped continuum which started with herring gulls. At every stage around the ring, the birds are sufficiently similar to their immediate neighbours in the ring to interbreed with them, until, that is, the ends of the continuum are reached and the ring bites itself in the tail. The herring gull and the lesser black-backed gull in Europe never interbreed, although they are linked by a continuous series of interbreeding colleagues all the way round the other side of the world. Ring species, like the salamanders and the gulls, are only showing us in the spatial dimension something that must always happen in the time dimension. Suppose we humans and the chimpanzees were a ring species. It could have happened, a ring perhaps moving up one side of the rift valley and down the other side, with two completely separate species coexisting at the southern end of the ring, but an unbroken continuum of interbreeding all the way up and back around the other side. If this were true, what would it do to our attitudes to other species, to apparent discontinuities generally? Many of our legal and ethical principles depend on the separation between Homo sapiens and all other species. Of the people who regard abortion as a sin, including the minority who go to the lengths of assassinating doctors and blowing up abortion clinics, many are unthinking meat-eaters and have no worries about chimpanzees being imprisoned in zoos and sacrificed in laboratories. Would they think again, if we could lay out a living continuum of intermediates between ourselves and chimpanzees, linked in an unbroken chain of interbreeders, like the Californian salamanders? Surely they would. Yet it is the merest accident that the intermediates all happen to be dead. It is only because of this accident that we can comfortably and easily imagine a huge gulf between our two species or between any two species for that matter.